My name is Colin Groves. I recently retired as Professor of Biological Anthropology and uh, I'm also a mammalogist and a primatologist. Okay. And uh, so you know about primates. Oh, yes. Are you a primate? I am. Are you a, uh, an ape? Oh, yes. Are, are you? Are you a greater? <laughs> I am, certainly. Yeah. Are you a great ape? A great ape, yes. Are you an African? Um, ultimately, yes. All right. And uh, are you a fish? Well, ultimately, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Long time ago, I was a fish. Now, I've read that there are different types of chimpanzees. There's the pan troglodytes yes. and the pan paniscus. So exactly. bonobos and chimps. But there are also several like subspecies of pan troglodytes. There's yeah. a troglodytes, troglodytes, and verus and Eli eliopti and schwein forti or something. And marungensis. And marungensis. So how many? Well, there should be um, about uh, five of them. Would you call these races? Subspecies. Subspecies. Isn't that kind of um, like what a race is? Sort of. It's uh, it purpose to be a little better defined than race. But um, really, subspecies are a bit slippery too. Um, the virus is much more distinct from the, the rest than they are from each other. How did that's, they get separated? That's the West African one. Um, well, they're now separated geographically. But what, what, now I, I look at a map of the chimps and I see that they're kind of north of the Zaire River and the yeah. bonobos are south. And I thought, well, it looks like the river, the Zaire River, divided this population in half. And, yeah. and uh, so that's how they, they've been diverging right. ever since. Well, what about these subspecies of chimps? What kind of um, separated them? Virus is west of the Niger. Eliotai is between the Niger and the Sanaga River in Cameroon. Um, Troglodytes, south of the Sanaga and north and west of the Congo Umbangi system. Schweinfurthii is north of the Congo, south of the Umbangi Uele system, and Marungensis is uh, the far south east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, extending into Tanzania and Uganda. And what are the various, what's the most obvious differences between these subspecies? There are no really obvious differences. There are average differences. Um, you can probably differentiate three quarters or more of, of virus. Um, perhaps the main thing is that um, in the youngsters, in, in, in the other forms, the face is usually sort of, from our point of view, flesh colored. Virus tends to develop a dark mask around the eyes, over the bridge of the nose. And as it matures, the mask gradually spreads till the whole face is black. In the others, the, the face generally darkens, sometimes developing freckles or tan spots. Now, in, in the human uh, history, there's been all kinds of uh, racial conflict in between civilizations. And uh, I know that, uh, I think Jane Goodall looked at uh, kind of like different clans or different groups of chimps fighting yeah. each other, but they're presumably the same subspecies. Yeah. Are, there, are there any examples of inter-subspecies war, like this subspecies fighting this subspecies? Not that I know of. Because they don't come into direct yeah. contact. Yeah. I see. Okay. So, you know, the chimps and humans had a common ancestor how long ago? Um, probably about six million. Six million. Okay. And... Since this time of the common ancestor, most people, most Homo sapiens, think that chimps are more like the common ancestor than humans are. And genetically, I presume that's not borne out. Is that no. right? No. Um, genetics shows that um, chimpanzees have diverged as much as humans. Um, and in fact, the chimpanzee genome is very slightly larger than the human genome. Okay, and uh, can you tell us about ways in which the chimps have diverged from this common ancestor? Um, well, they're um, uh, probably the uh, the locomotion, the knuckle walking, is is one way. Wait, so you think our common ancestor with chimps six million years ago did not do knuckle walking? I used to think they did, but now I tend to doubt it, because the other knuckle walker, the gorilla, which is the next most closely related to us and chimps. Uh -huh. Um, also knuckle walks, but the um, 
anatomical specializations are rather different. Oh. So, okay. I don't know. Okay, but, but how about in terms of, uh, I don't know, for example, humans say, oh, look at us, we got this job, bigger brain than our yeah. common ancestors. We are hairless and we walk on two feet. These are all yeah. very obvious traits that humans are very proud of that mm -hmm. distinguish us from the common ancestor with, uh, with yeah. chimps. But are there, aren't there any equally obvious ones with uh, chimps? Uh, well, um, yes, when you see chimps mating, there is. The, um, the male chimp has a, an incredibly long, thin, almost spike-like penis, and the female develops an enormous pink cushion-like sexual swelling. And uh, when, she, when she comes into sexual receptivity, and then when she's mated, the sexual swelling deflates very quickly. That is something quite um, unprecedented in the apes. Wow, so the gorillas don't have that? No, gorillas have a slight swelling of the, of the vulva. And the orangutans? No, no swelling. And ho female homo sapiens? Not as far as I know. Has it ever been looked for? I think it has, yes. And there must be some analogous, very, very, very weak signal that should be able to pick up during estrus. Um, it is said that the behavior of the human female changes somewhat. And her, her male preference changes somewhat. Okay, in towards from what to what? From um, uh, um, when she's in estrus, um, apparently, um, and she's shown um, pictures of lots and lots of men, male faces, and asked a preference. She chooses the hunk. The hunk in estrus and yeah. out of estrus, out not of so estrus, much. No, she chooses ordinary sort of. Nice-looking men. <laughs> the, the idea is that um, she wants the hunk for the genes. She wants the nice-looking men as the nurturing types who are going to look after her infants. That's the rationale. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. What do we and the two species of chimps share that gorillas don't share? Ah. That's interesting. Um, let me think about that. The one. reason why this is a question yeah. is because most people think, oh, chimps yeah. and gorillas are more closely related yeah. than they are to us, and that's obviously wrong. We yeah. and chimps are as closely related to gorillas uh, uh, as each other, and yeah. so there must be some things that we and the chimps yeah. have that gorillas don't have. Yeah. That... Well, we have <coughs> lost our gross sexual dimorphism. Ah, the gorillas have that in a big that's way. Right. They and do. orangs too, yeah. right? Y yes, they do. In, in a rather different way. Um, but um, gorillas have a rather primitive um, molar teeth, molar and premolar teeth. Chimps and humans have much simpler premolar and molar teeth without, um, without the large crest of uh, gorillas on their teeth. And gorillas also have what's called a cingulum, which is a sort of shelf of enamel on their molar teeth. Oh. We don't. We have much simpler teeth, simplified. How about sagittal crest? Um, yeah, um, male chimps and females occasionally can develop a small sagittal crest. Was homo sapiens too? Not homo sapiens, no. Oh, but gorillas certainly have a more prominent one, don't they? Oh, yeah. Almost all adult male gorillas develop a really huge sagittal crest and a mid nuchal crest behind the back of the skull as well. I see. Okay, so to summarize, what do we and the chimps have in common that, that's different from gorillas? Um, smaller, simplified molar teeth, smaller canine teeth, loss of gross sexual dimorphism, oh, um, uh, extreme age graying and balding. Extreme age graying and balding, that's yes. what we do. That's what you're kind of grayish, right? I'm grayish. You're 73. Yes. You're Even balding. Yes. Bald. And we have that in common with chimps, but yeah. the gorillas don't do that. They yeah. Gorillas don't go bald, and uh, they, um, it's dubious, doubtful whether they really uh, go gray with age. Okay, how about same question, but not chimps versus gorillas, but chimps. Humans, gorillas versus the orangutans. Yes. What do we chimps, gorillas, and orang humans have that orangutans don't have? Oh, brow ridges. Brow ridges. Yes. 
like these uh, things here. Yeah, but that's right. We don't have them very well developed, or most modern human stones, but not very far back in the past. We had quite big ones. And Orangutans don't. So chimps and gorillas have them. Yeah. Homo erectus had them. Yeah. We kind of have little ones, and orangutans don't have any. No, they don't. They have a sort of um, raised rim around the orbits. The whole th you know, orangutans are so highly specialized, it's almost difficult to compare them. Well, how about gibbons? Um, gibbons have, no, they don't have um, brow ridges. They, they have um, sort of um, uh, slight prominent shelves around the eyes. Not like an orangutan, sort of difficult to, um, to describe, but different. Okay, now the same question for all the great apes compared to the gibbons. Yeah. Oh, um, the great apes, they have um, a smaller coccyx. Smaller coccyx, so gibbons have a little bit of a coccyx. Yes, they have oh. about five vertebrae in the coccyx. And we have? We have um, usually three, sometimes four. Oh. Um, we have a much broader, deeper chest. Um, we um, have a different kind of wrist. Gibbons have an extra bone in the wrist called os de bontonai, which, uh, which we all lack. Um, all the great apes lack this bone. Yeah. So we have, it has degenerated in us, or no, is the it... the gibbons had developed it. So other old world monkeys do not have it. No, they don't. Oh. And gibbons have um, a very strange system because they brachiate. They do a lot of hanging and swinging from the arms. There's little slips of muscle between um, all the muscles as they go down the arm. It's called a muscle chain, which means that um, when they hold their arm above their head, they cannot but put their hand into a hook. Oh. Because as this muscle contracts, so the slip of muscle connecting to this one contracts, and the slip of muscle connecting that one to that one contracts, moving the hand into a hook. What about features in gibbons that they share with all of our ancestors previous to that, but are derived, some special things that are derived in, or have been lost in the great apes? Oh. So you talk about something that is kind of specialized yeah. to gibbons. I was yeah. more interested okay. in what do the gibbons have that is ancestral that the uh, greater apes don't? Well, um, hmm. yes, the shape of the canines. The shape of the canines. The canines of gibbons are long, thin, and dagger-like with a, uh, a blade up the back. Oh. And the um, anterior lower premolar is modified to receive it. Was that because they're more carnivorous or something? Or? No, um, I don't know why. All right. Maybe um, great ape canines are used more in, uh, in feeding. But uh, there is a bizarre thing about gibbons. Having said that, the canines are the same in both male and female gibbons. Uh -huh. Gibbons have um, in size and shape no sexual dimorphism at all. If there is any sexual dimorphism in gibbons, in some species, it's in color. In color, yes. I see. So I've heard that sexual dimorphism, so males bigger and females smaller, yeah. is often associated with whether there's monogamy or not. If there, yeah. there are no sexual dimorphism means they're monogamous, and if there is a huge one, then you have more yeah. polygamy. Uh, no sexual dimorphism means either that you're monogamous or that you're promiscuous. Chimps are promiscuous, highly. And orangutans? Orangutans, they are, like in everything else, odd. <laughs> okay. so. Promiscuous, if you like. Um, and oh. they have um, something that uh, no other ape and uh, only a couple of other primates have, which is um, uh, that they can delay, the males can delay full physical maturity. Males can be sexually mature, like a human teenage boy, but they can prolong this for 20, 30 years oh. before they become physically mature, if they want. Is it if they want, or is there are environmental signals that control Probably this? there's environmental signals. Very likely, 
the presence of a dominant male nearby. <coughs> so presumably there are things that we share with gorillas that the chimps don't share with gorillas. Hmm. There probably are. I'd have to think a while uh, before them. Um, yeah, the shape of the foot. Shape of the foot. Yeah. And gorillas don't have the divergent great toe like chimps. It's sort of semi-divergent like that. You're in, talking about a thumb, a big in, toe? or yeah, yeah, big toes. In lowland gorillas, it's fairly divergent, but not the enormous, long, thumb-like great toe of chimpanzees. Mountain gorillas, um, not very divergent at all. How about opposable thumbs? Are, is yeah. that equal in, in yeah. all of them? They're um, fairly opposable in all, but because of the relative shortness of the thumb compared to the fingers, um, they can't quite manage the precision grip that we can. Because the sh thumb is short, so they tend to go like that oh. when holding an object. Oh, so we have a precision grip because our thumbs are longer? Because our thumbs are longer and our fingers are relatively shorter. Oh, okay. And that gives us a precision grip for holding yeah, things. That's right. We hold things by a power grip and we want to hold them tightly like that. By a precision grip. Uh, show those two again. Show those. Okay, I'll show it with with your pen. Okay. Power grip. In towards the camera, please. So the power grip is like that. Like that. Okay. Precision grip. Oh. Is like that. Oh. So it's Pulp actually just thumb. one finger in. Well, it can be one finger, or it can be all of them. But I see. It's, it's a very delicate, well, precise grip. Can orangutans do that? No. I've seen orangutans take banana peels and just peel yeah. them and peel them yeah. and peel. So you have a long string like this yeah. of a banana peel. I've, oh, never, yes. I've never done that myself, but no. I was, uh, that must take a lot yeah. of precision. If you, if you notice, what they're doing is, again, like this. Ah. Holding the, the thumb against the thumb. The, the orangutan's thumb is much stronger than that of a gorilla or chimpanzee. Oh, why is that? Um, I don't know. Unclear. Maybe because they do much more climbing and the thumb has to act as a sort of stop digit sometimes, maybe present, you know, preventing the rest of them slipping around the branch, something like that. Okay, now I've heard that many dark-skinned Africans have babies that are paler for, what, three weeks or so. Yeah. Now, and I guess I would then say, well, then maybe that's evidence that the ans our ancestors had paler skin, and then because of the influence of, I guess, a lot of sunshine, that uh, they got darker, more melanin. But is there any evidence that these pale Europeans with very white skin also have babies that are more dark because that would represent an ancestral? No. 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 Um, the, uh, the ancestral skin color of humans was probably black. And now a chimpanzee, you know, even a, an adult chimpanzee with black face, black palms and soles has a pale skin underneath its hair. Um, and maybe that's all that, uh, that the pale babies of Africans means. Okay. All right. So, not, so, the, so your best guess at the, let's say, 100,000 or 200,000 years ago, what, or maybe even more, maybe a half a million years ago, the skin color of our ancestors was kind of light brown or dark brown or Probably deep dark, black? Probably dark brown. As brown well, as African population, like Nubians, or, or yeah. more like, I don't know, some other, like, how about, for example, the deepest rooted, we sometimes say, or the earliest divergence among human populations are with the... The Khaesan. Uh, the Khaesan. Yes. Now, their skin is not dark no. black. There, it's so, kind of a yellowish, brownish exactly. kind of... Do you think yeah. that's a good candidate for... It could be. Um, I mean, we... We, we don't know. I mean, they divided from other Africans, from the people we think of as black Africans. So if you like, they sort of originated at the same time. When do you think yeah. that divergence was? Oh, something like um, 150,000 years ago. But of course, in, in the case of human populations, it, it's never complete divergence. Yes. They come back together again and so on. Yes. So you can get what we think of as typical, say, Bushman genes in East Africans. Yes. Okay. Now, 
I was talking to a dinosaur expert, Tom Rich, in Melbourne the other oh, day. Oh, yes, that's and, right. And he talked about the KT uh, boundary and, you know, the yeah. big wiping out of lots of creatures yeah. and essentially, you know, ending the dinosaur reign and then starting the mammalian radiation. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that's very important to me, I think, and to many others is immediately after this big boom, there were, I guess, ungulates were separate from our lineage. Yeah. Now... When Harry Jerison has traced encephalization quotient in mm -hmm. our lineage, it gets more and more and more and more. So what I'm interested in is, after a lineage has separated from ours, is there any evidence that the encephalization quotient gets larger? Is there oh, any yes. selection pressure for that? Yes. And he mentioned ungulates yeah. as one of the groups. Yeah. So after they diverged from us, their brain cases got bigger. They did. And carnivores even more so. So how many lineages <coughs> can you say that about? Um, How many lineages with encephalization mm. or, or with, with a central nervous system have a brain that got bigger over time? How many have a brain that got smaller over time? How mm. many stayed about the same? Yeah. There's no evidence one way or the other. Uh, stayed about the same, I'd say, um, the, the creatures called insectivores. You know, they're, they're not related to each other, but they retain a lot of primitive characters together, like shrews, moles, Hedgehogs, Tenrex, Selenodons, um, elephant shrews, tree shrews, their brains didn't increase. Um, whereas um, the brains in ungulates, um, especially, more especially perissodactyls, increased those are, in all. Those are which ones are those? The odd toed ones. Odd toed. Horses, tapers, rhinos. Horses, tapers, and rhinos. Especially horses. Horses' brains got bigger. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about encephalization quotient, not yeah, the uh, right, yeah. not just body yeah. size and therefore brain size. Yeah, yeah. Um, the encephalization quotient suffers from uh, the drawback that it it still has this body size component, so it can't distinguish between forms in which the brain got larger and forms in which the body got larger. I thought that's okay. why there was an exponent in the you know mass of the brain divided by the mass of the body to some yeah. exponent power and that exponent power was supposed to take it to include the allometry you know the big body big brain and therefore yeah. no increase in EQ. It prob probably um, yeah it, it, um, it did that but um, when, you, when you look at say the primates um, nonetheless you know with the best will in the world of Jerison and so on um, a small, the smallest old world monkey, which is the talapoin of West Central Africa, has a higher encephalization quotient than the gorilla. And you think, something's wrong there. Because gorillas are not that different from chimps in their cognition. And so what's happened in the gorilla, almost certainly, is that the gorilla's got enormous. <laughs> and left, you know, left the brain behind. So, but let me get this straight, though. Do you think that there's good evidence in many lineages that the encephalization quotient, not mm -hmm. just the brain size, but the encephalization quotient, quotient. has increased yeah. after it diverged from humans? Yes. And uh, has there any that got smaller, the encephalization quotient reduced? Um, yes, some. Um, some island forms, and this is very recent. The first one in which it was shown to happen was uh, um, a, a goat-like creature called Myotragus, which lived on the Balearic Islands off the coast of Spain. And um, they've been there since late Miocene and are descended from goat-like creatures. I think it's known which ones on the continent of Europe. And they got smaller in size, short-limbed and so on, but their brain got noticeably smaller. Nothing to eat them on the Balearic. So, so if there are multiple lineages in which EQ increased, why, didn't, why aren't there multiple lineages in which it increased a lot to become you know, big brain like we think we are? Um, yeah, I think the only other ones in which it increased to that extent 
are the uh, the toothed whales. The toothed whales, which are we now know artiodactyls, uh -huh. but they're descended from even-toed ungulates. Even-toed ungulates, okay. Like like cattle, sheep, deer, giraffes, and their closest relative is hippos. Now, so what is there in common between these? two groups, the artiodactyls, or the, the whales, the cetaceans, yeah. and humans, that is not the same for the predator-prey increase of EQ? The are question, they more social, for example? They are, but the question's been asked a lot of times, and nobody has really had a satisfactory answer. Um, I mean, you can, the, it, it is famously the biggest brain in the world is the brain of the sperm whale. Not the blue whale? No. Blue whales are yeah, not tooth whales. No, they're baleen whales. Oh. And they haven't undergone the huge increases of, of the tooth whale. Well, I mean, if, if that seems to be... I mean, I, I've read that, oh, yes, if you have predator prey going on all the time, then you have to figure out new ways of figuring catching mm -hmm. the prey, and the, pre the, pred the predators have to think of new ways of catching, and the prey yeah. have to new ways of escaping, and so there's an arms race. I mean, yeah. that's what I've heard... How legitimate is that? That's possible, but not... Yeah, you can, you can say that um, dolphins, for example, they're very clever at catching their prey, but um, they're not necessarily more clever than humpback whales, which are baleen whales, or um, lots of other carnivores. So tooth whales, so what do you think these... What is this largest brain on the planet? Sperm whale. Sperm whale. So what do they do with this brain? I don't know. Um, we don't know very much about them, because until um, about 30 or 40 years ago, the only human interest in sperm whales was in catching as many as possible, getting oil and spermaceti out of them. Was Moby Dick a sperm whale? Yes. I see. So and did the... Moby Dick, you know, was based on a real whale. Oh, I didn't know that. Called uh, Mocha Dick, who... Um, swam up and down the west coast of South America and was, was responsible for, for sinking quite a number of whale, whale boats. Really? Yeah. You, did, did they have any idea why? I suppose it had been harpooned so many times. It was angry at anything yeah. that looked like a boat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. So now I want to, I want to, just a second, I'm going to go over here and get a book. You can, you can stay where you are. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you know, this is a course, wait a minute, this is a, what we're trying to do is put together a MOOC, and we're trying to understand how we got here. Yeah. And by understanding how we got here, hopefully we can try to make a better estimate of are we alone. Now, yeah. One way to, to look at Are We Alone, here's a, a chart of hominid evolution. And mm. I've got, that's one chart here, and here's a, another one. Could you pass me my glasses? Sure. There are your glasses. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. So I, these are things I just, I just typed into Google. Hominid evolution, I got these things here. Yeah. So I was hoping that you could describe for us, you know, what's wrong, what's right about these things. What is your mm -hmm. vision of, and specifically... The big question of which of these critters in the last five million years are, do you think, good candidates for being our ancestors, and which are what you call, I think, sister groups? Yes. Well, sister groups is actually a um, cladistic term. Um, so what would you say? Cousins or something. But, but notice in this one, for example, here yeah. they have all these different types of fossils, yeah. and they don't really draw any lines between them, no. right? And so... Uh, they just say, these existed from here to here, yeah. and from this time to this time. And that one, for example, all these skulls. But the question is, are those, did any of, which of them are our ancestors, and which of them are kind of like chimps and uh, orangutans well, and gorillas? Looking at this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Could you show the camera which one that is? Yeah, that just, one. just hold it like that. Like that, looking at this one, what do you say? Homo heidelbergensis has a much, it goes back that far, and Homo agaster goes to there. Right, so what so you're doing Homo is... Homo agaster to Homo heidelbergensis, then splitting to Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. 
So you think that there's a connection between which ones again? Agasta, Heidelbergensis, and then splitting to Sapiens and Neanderthalensis. Okay, and so what about this guy? These were these are sister group then. Erectus. Okay, Erectus. I think ought, we ought to divide it into uh, two, no, three now. You're dividing Homo erectus into three groups, yeah. three species. Yeah, one in Java, one in China, and one in Georgia. And when did they come out of Africa? Um, the, the Georgian one may have come out of Africa more than two million years ago and then spread back in and may be the ancestor of Homo agaster. But here okay. they only go back to 1.2, 1, 1 this Homo yeah. erectus. They yeah. don't go back that far. Yeah, they, they've obviously forgotten about, about Homo georgicus. Is it on this one? No, but at least in this one they've got Erectus going back nearly to two. Homo georgicus is well dated. It's 1.8 million. That's the earliest evidence for it? Yeah, well, it's, it's the only evidence. So essentially you're taking Homo erectus and dividing into Homo erectus 1, Homo erectus 2, and Homo erectus 3. Sort of. Sort of. There, are they subspecies, you be, think? No, they're species. The species. Homo erectus proper in Java, um, about 1.5 to... Ooh, 0.4 million. Homo picinensis in China, um, about 0.8 to 0.4. Homo georgicus in the Republic of Georgia, 1.8 million. Now, are we to imagine that all three of those could interbreed and therefore we have ancestors in all three of those groups, or do we have ancestors in only one of those groups? Probably only in Homo georgicus. Only Homo, even the Chinese, pop, the Han population in China, only Homo George. They would probably, I think they would yeah. not, not like to hear that. I know they wouldn't. No. <laughs> it's, it's sort of, you know, standard mythology, like, uh, like in India, standard mythology is the Aryan invasions. In China, standard mythology is Peking man was the earliest Chinaman. Yes. Um, every, everybody has their own myth. Of origin. Well, what's the evidence against that? That um, uh, it is less like Homo sapiens than is its, its contemporary Homo hanlebergensis. I see, or Homo georgicus, you said. Yeah, but Homo georgicus is much earlier. Much earlier. So Homo georgicus, Homo agaster, Homo hanlebergensis, Homo sapiens. And that those are our ancestors. Yeah. So let's go back to I don't know a million years ago, and I want to ask you the question. Now, put your who were we a million years ago? We were Homo ergaster on the cusp of becoming Homo heidelbergensis. Okay. So let's put ourselves a million years ago. We were what you just said, <laughs> and if we looked around and we asked ourselves the question, "Are we alone?" Yeah. What would we think? What would we say? Well, we would probably think we were, because... Because um, we're um, so better than those other uh, <laughs> because relatives? We, um, our ancestors lived in Africa. Uh, Homo heidelbergensis lived... Uh, wait a minute, I'll change that a bit, because um, the genus Paranthropus uh, um, was just hanging on in parts of Africa. Well, if we go back, I guess two million or one and a half million years ago where we had these three species of Homo erectus, you said. Well, but they, they lived in different parts of the world. Right, but they were living simultaneously. Yeah. And so if they had known about the rest of the world, they would encounter them, maybe out their boundaries, they would encounter well, them. Probably. And they would say, oh, they're not like us and they're not, and we'd kill them if we could yeah. see them. And Well, the men would probably kill the men and interbreed with the women. Uh -huh. that's, that's the way it is. Well, if they did a lot of that, then they would be merging and they wouldn't be separate species no. anymore. Right? No, they wouldn't necessarily be merging. Not that much no. sex. <laughs> no. well, and probably um, one would be dominant to the other, and so one would be increasing while the other was declining. Mm -hmm. So that um, there wouldn't be many of the, uh, the subordinate one to do any breeding. Okay, how about three million years ago? Uh, three million Who years ago. Who were we ago? three million years ago? Uh, that, um, 
we were probably Homo afarensis, maybe on the cusp of evolving into something else that we want not of. And who were our closest extant relatives at that time? Um, Homo africanus or Australopithecus africanus in South Africa, um, Paranthropus ethiopicus in East Africa, maybe, yes, Kenyanthropus platyops in East Africa, though that might have become extinct by then. So the reason, the reason I'm asking you this is because often Homo sapiens think that we are totally divorced from the rest of the animal kingdom because mm. we're so special. And one of the reasons we're special is we've killed off a lot of our ancestors or yeah. our, our, not our ancestors, our sister groups have yeah. either been killed off or they've died. Yeah. Now, is that something uh, kind of, I guess, only now is that the case? And earlier it was not that much the case because I guess we weren't as efficient as killing our competitors? Yeah, yeah probably not. So um, we, um, for instance, replaced Neanderthals um, in Europe um, by maybe we, you know, walloped them in warfare, or we, we just out-competed them anyway. And um, the suggestion is that Neanderthals were never capable of occupying Europe at such population densities as early Homo sapiens. Hmm. All right. And uh, uh, so do these charts agree with each other? Is there a lot of agreement no. about this? I mean, can you take us through our ancestors all the way back to, I don't know, five million years ago? Yeah. Okay. So right now we have Homo sapiens. Right now we have Homo sapiens. And then we go back 30,000 years ago and then there was Neanderthals, a sister group. Yeah. Then, and then we go back to 600,000 years ago, and then we our common ancestor was right. Neanderthal. Homo heidelbergensis. Homo heidelbergensis. And then we go back, and then who is it that diverges from our ancestors? From Homo heidelbergensis? Yes. Well, there was this funny thing um, known only from uh, northern Spain, a couple of sites, called Homo antecessor. Nobody knows where it fits. Uh huh. And it's. Um, some people even think that it might have been our ancestor. This is how long ago? 200,000? No, it's um, uh, 800,000 to 1.2 million. Oh, okay. Um, but basically, um, Homo heidelbergensis was, um, uh, was contemporary. It was found in Africa and Europe and probably also in India and occasionally in China, spread its range. And in China it would have encountered Homo picanensis, probably. And you think they went extinct, Homo picanensis? Yeah. And the other Homo erectus-like thing that went in extinct? In Java. In Java. There's no evidence there was anything but Homo erectus in Java from 1.5 million until about 400,000. Excuse me. Uh -huh. um, um, so um, other species probably didn't get there, although we now have Homo floresiensis in Flores, which is two islands east of Java. So perhaps, probably, they had to get through Java to get there. We don't. We have no fossils of them, but it may well be that Homo erectus. When it arrived in Java, got rid of the ancestors of Homo floresiensis. What about, I've heard that there were kind of like two, two subspecies of Homo sapiens in, among the aboriginals like 20,000 years ago in Australia. No, hmm. it, was, um, it was an error. Um, certainly um, the uh, Australian uh, skull form has changed. And for instance, the the large brow ridges and relatively sloping forehead that um, uh, modern uh, Aboriginal people have is, um, is something that developed between about 40,000 and 20,000 years ago. Um, the, the error arose because um, uh, some of the remains from um, Cow Swamp in Victoria and elsewhere 
um, had this cultural practice of artificial cranial deformation in infancy. Excuse oh. me. And this made the skull of some of them look a bit superficially like that of Homo erectus. Oh, okay. And it, there's not two, two races or anything. So if, if somebody believes that we are alone on Earth, they're essentially saying, you know, our species is somehow special. And why I keep on asking about earlier, one million, two million, mm -hmm. three million years ago, is because whether that perception of being different goes away, or is it actually just the same, and it's just our prejudice now that we think we're different? Um, yeah. I mean, we, we know that early Homo sapiens did interbreed with Neanderthals, and did interbreed with these mysterious people called Denisovans. Mm -hmm. When were they? Um, they're, they're known by two, two finger bones and two teeth, and they are about 40,000 years old. 40,000 years old. So they were simultaneously alive when Neanderthals, almost early Homo sapiens, yeah. and uh, the Denisovans. Denisovans, that's right. Oh, yeah. And they probably all had sex with each other, but they were geographically separated and only had sex with the boundaries or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any idea what kind of they looked like? Are they small, short? No. They have dark Den skin, no. light skin? We don't know anything about Denisovans, but their finger joints and their teeth. But I've heard that they had some genes, Svantopabe got some genes, yeah. and they were able to then figure out which current day populations had a little yes. bit of Denisovan right. uh, genes in them. And from those genes, they should be able to tell what their characteristics were and how they were different yeah. from... I don't think they've done that yet. They've done it with Neanderthals. Okay. But um, they are um, the population today with the highest proportion of Denisovan genes are Australomelanesian. Australo-Melanesians, not Aborigines? Yes, Aborigines and oh, Melanesians. and Melanesians, okay. That's the australo -Mate. All right. Now, I asked you before, you know, we are eukaryotes, and we're bilateria, yeah. and we're deuterostomes, yeah. and we're vertebrates, mammals and, and primates, and we're dry-nosed primates, Yes. Uh, and we're great apes. And I asked you if we were a fish, and sometimes you said yes, and sometimes you said no. And so the reason... I have, the reason I'm asking this is because I've made these charts here. Let me just hold it up there. Okay. So we have a chart where Homo sapiens over here. Yeah. And these are different groups that have diverged mm -hmm. from our lineage. That's right. Yeah. And so what I try to do is give a name for what went this way and what a name for what went this way. Yeah. And so here, for example, the kid something and then the chordata and then the jawed fish and then the jawless fish and then the bony fish and then the, the cartilaginous fish. That's right. And then they... Lobe fin fish and then the ray fin fish. So the whole point is that each one of these points, there's a, a, grou a group here. And so this is a fish right here. So everything yeah. above this, yeah. I would call a fish. Did, did I say that, that we weren't a fish? You did, and you, you did said it? yes and no, because no, you said, said you used to be a we fish. We used to be a fish. Now, well, because fish is such an ingrained fur term of folk taxonomy. I see. You said that, okay, so, but I'm trying to understand these trees and taking them seriously, and yeah. therefore I'd like to make the names that I use encompass all of that, mm. and then encompass all of that. And, yeah. and in other words, create monophyletic names yeah. that make sense according to what we know about our ancestry. Yeah. And so that's why I said I'm trying to convince people that I'm a fish. For example, I go to an aquarium, and I have, I see the two fins in the front and the two fins in the back and I say well that's just like me these are my yeah. my pelvic my pelvic fins are here and then my what's it called the pectoral. pectoral fins are here and I said wow almost all the fish I'm looking at have that exact configuration yeah. I said and the coelacanths have that and the lobe fin fish so that's yeah. where I evolved from so those must be homologous structures yeah but when I say that to some people they say oh no we're not a fish and those your arms and legs have nothing to do with those pectoral and uh, pelvic fins. Well, and I said, that's do. crazy. It must. They do. Yeah. They must. They so these, have. so what you have here, these arms are, used to be pectoral fins. Yes. Okay. And these legs you have used to be pelvic fins. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm glad <laughs> that's straight now because that doesn't seem to be, no. Okay. Another question. Rabbits and rodents have a common ancestor with us about 75 million years ago and cats and dogs about 85. It's very controversial. Is it? 
um, because you know the the molecular clock is not a fixed thing. Yes. So it's difficult. Wait, yeah. mm -hmm. So it's difficult to um, say how fast it was going at any one time. Um, so uh, some people put um, the ancestors of the different placental mammal orders before the KT boundary, and others put it after. Right. It's called the the long fuse versus the short fuse mm. hypothesis. I see. But in any case, it seems from the genes that we are more closely related to rodents and rabbits than we are to yeah. cats and dogs. Yeah. And in this one book I'm reading, or several books, there's 10 million years difference. In other words, we're 10 million years closer to a rat than we are to my dog. Maybe, yeah. And my question is, in 10 million years, a lot can happen. So yeah. what is it about, you know, I was asking what, how are we similar with the chimps? Well, how is, are we similar with rats in a way that differentiates us from dogs? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, um, <laughs> Ten million well, years yeah. is a long time, yeah. so a lot can happen. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you can say that, um, you know, dogs... I mean, it's, it's easier to say what's happened to the carnivores than to say what happened to the Uarchontoglyres, which are the... Um, primates and rodents and rabbits. Uh -huh. um, and what's happened to the dogs is they develop paws, they develop the carnivore, the carnassial teeth, the, um, um, you know, the, the various specializations for predatory behavior. Right, but I'm not asking about that. What I'm trying I to know. say, I'm asking about the yeah. 10 million years that separate us. What is it that, uh, how did the what do we share with rats that we don't share with dogs? Kind of. I, I don't know. The, um, that isn't a result of derivations no. along the canine line, no. I guess. The um, conclusion that, um, or the discovery of the uh, various superorders of mammals, of placental mammals, is about 15 years old. And morphologists really haven't quite come to terms with it. There's a guy called Novacek in the American Museum of Natural History who now looks intently for detailed morphological features that unite the orders of the various superorders. When you look at the genes, however... Uh, they the genes can, are quite clear. The genes talk about the Afrotheres from Africa, yeah. Yeah. and they, have a, they give a date of about 105 million years. And then According the to some. According to some. And then the Xenarthrans... In South America, 95 million years, so 10 yeah. more million years closer. Yeah. And then the Laurasia there is 85 million years ago from Laurasia. And then the rodents, supposedly, another 10 million closer. Now, what they don't do is they don't give a geographical region for these rodents. No. And that's kind of weird because the closer you get, the more recent, the closer you get to today, yeah. the easier it should be to figure out the geographical origin of a group. Yeah. And this is just the opposite. We have Africa, then South America, then Laurasia. So then I said, well, where do the rodents come from? Because we'd like yeah. to know where primates came from. Yeah, exactly. Well, the earliest primates are um, used to be thought of as North American. But some very early ones are now turning up in Africa. The things, the North American things that we thought were primates might not be. How old? They are Paleocene. How old is that? Well, Paleocene is... Um, um, 55 to 65 million. Uh-huh. Okay. Paleocene is what came immediately after that asteroid. Okay. Now, let, let me ask you about, the, in the great apes, the number of chromosomes. Yeah. We have, what do we have, 23? Yeah. 23. And how many do chimps have? Oh, um, they have, uh, well, 24. No, wait a minute. 24. Um, no. um, Are we? Yeah, humans... Uh, 23 pairs 46. and 46 That's chromosomes, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the chimps have 24 no, no, pairs? Yeah, no, it's, sorry. Humans, 22 pairs and... Oh, God. No, oh. I know it's 23 yeah. because the yeah. yeah. genome sequencing company is called 23andMe. That's, right. That's right, yes. And so it's yeah. 23 great pairs. Apes. Great apes, one more pair. Yeah. Great apes, all of them. The chimps, the gorillas, the bonobos, the uh, yeah. orangutans, all bonobos of them. Bonobos are just a species of chimps. Right, okay. Yeah. So they have... 
24 yeah. pairs. But um, when, when you, um, this was done oh, way back in the 1980s, I think, um, staining of chromosomes with various stains brings out bands. Yes, it, yes, yes, yes. And the chromosome banding pattern of the orangutan is very different from that of humans, chimps, and gorillas. Mm -hmm. That of the gorilla is quite different from that of chimps and humans, yes. which are very similar to each other. Yes. And the difference is that human chromosome 2 is composed of two small chromosomes of a great ape, uh -huh. like the chimpanzee, which have stuck together. Can you look at the chromosomes of these early fossil hominids at all and no. then figure out when that no. chromosomal change occurred? No. You can't. You can't look at fossils for chromosomes. You can't. No. All you can say is they that... They got the Denisovans. Uh, they got some genes out of that. Svante Pabo. Genes. That's different. Oh. Because the DNA... Uh, oh. Then the chromosomes disintegrate. Nice. The DNA sort of disintegrates, oh. but segments of it I see, I see. Under certain conditions. Oh, I see. Okay. How about um, morality? Now, humans think that we have some type of uh, monopoly on morality. My word, yes. My word, yes. yes. Now, yes. presumably you agree with that or disagree with that. And what type of morality do you see in, in chimps and uh, bonobo, well, bonobos and gorillas and yeah. orangutans and gibbons? There must be some type of... I don't know, some type of progression, not progression, but differences yeah. there. Yeah, well, they don't have the sort of wide-ranging morality that we do, but um, they have what has sometimes been described as uh, friendships. Friendships. Um, and uh, it used to be thought that um, male chimpanzees within a community were brothers and paternal cousins, but... It's not necessarily the case. And female chimps generally um, enter the community from outside and they get on with each other. They sometimes go around in groups. How about laughing? Oh, yes. Chimpanzees laugh. They do? Yeah. Uh, what kind of joke? Can you tell me a chimp joke? Well, when they're, no, <laughs> when they're enjoying themselves. I mean, I've seen, uh, I saw, I watched for quite a long time, in the early morning before the public had arrived, in Amsterdam Zoo, um, a couple of chimps um, rolling, was it barrels or something, or perhaps it might have been boxes, around on, on a newly hosed concrete floor. So the boxes, they were going, you know, they were sort of <laughs> slipping, sliding around. They were going, <laughs> <laughs> as they pushed them around. I see. All right. And uh, so that's laughing. How yeah. about angry at each other? They beat up at each other. Oh, yeah. You stole that from me. That's mine. Oh, they, sh they sure do, yeah. They sure do that. Yeah. Okay, you've seen that. Um, yes, yeah. All right. How about jealousy? Sexual jealousy? Um, in a way, because um, uh, in, in chimpanzees, um, when a female comes into estrus, a normal method of mating is promiscuity. All the males sort of converge on her, and any that's not willing, she kind of backs into them. Bonobos too? Um, yeah, only bonobos are in more or less perpetual Easter. Perpetual. <laughs> um, the, um, but, um, so we're the most prudent of all the uh, apes, the three chimpanzees? Yeah, sort of. But, um, Prudish, uh, rather, yeah. not prudent. <laughs> I'm prudent too. <laughs> Um, but uh, there are um, male and female chimps that form consort ships. So some, sometimes a female will sort of make for this male, try to sequester herself from the rest of the community. Uh -huh. Like Romeo and, and Juliet yeah, here. Like. And the male and female will move around together, sometimes perhaps for, you know, two whole Easter cycles of the female, and um, they have to remain quiet, which is difficult for a chimp. Yes. And they have to try to um, avoid the neighboring community as well. Does her <laughs> butt get any less red? 
No? Oh. She still smells up. And that's when the, most of them make most of them make Do they drink, look into each other's eyes as if some kind of love? I don't think so, no. But nonetheless, they stick together. And um, so the male, you know, would try to sequester that particular femur. You can describe that as, as a sort of jealousy. Well, what about females when they come into estrus? Can't they, don't they have a, uh, somehow, aren't they selecting which males they want to have sex with and which males they don't? They don't? Um, not usually. Not usually. Usually, usually it's fine. Um, in the um, sexual selection um, is usually on the part of the males because you know male chimps have enormous testes, mm -hmm. and um, uh, that's because of sperm competition within yeah, this right. promiscuous sperm competition, and it's possible that the female chimp somehow selects the sperm of the particular male that she wants to uh, father her in. How about the su very controversial subject of rape? In mm. humans, rape, there's rape in humans, there's rape in orangutans, there's a rape in gorillas. Oh, yeah. And in what circumstances? Not in gorillas. No rape in gorillas no. because the big male gorilla has his yeah. harem. He has a monopoly of the females. Well, and well, his... But certainly they have to fight for how many females. I want 15. Oh, yeah. No, you only have 10. You have 15. Right, I yeah. only have 10. Yeah. I want 12. Or... That's, that's for the... Uh, the one male groups of the Western gorillas, uh -huh. um, and uh, certainly, the, do they steal each other's females? Is um, there a competition for that? Yeah, um, not enough is known yet about Western gorillas. They've been seen fighting the males and displaying to each other, um, but um, there's been some photogrammetry. You know, you you measure the males from afar. Um, what correlates with them? How many females a male has? And generally, it's um, the size of his buttocks and the size of his... his um, sagittal crest? Sagittal crest and the way it's packed around with, with hair and fat and muscle. Right, but what about rapes? So you said there's no rapes in gorillas, no. but how about orangutans, chimps? Orangutans, chimpanzees, no, probably not, because um, females... Don't are, resist uh, anybody. No, they don't resist anybody. And when they're not in estrus... They're of no interest to the male. And how long are they in interest? Yeah, estrus. Um, it's about five or six days, I think. Five or six. So yeah. that's kind of like Homo sapiens, then. Yeah, that's right. Huh. Um, so no rape in yeah. chimps and no rape in bonobos. Um, um, no, because bonobos are interested in sex the entire time. Okay, and is there any way to you know in in Homo sapiens we talk about heterosexual men and yeah. homosexual men. Yeah. If you tried to do that with bonobos, it would just be a useless exercise yeah, everybody's because everybody's a... everybody is everything. Everybody's everything. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I've I've not found another species in which um, individuals are sort of decisively homosexual for life. Um, what they uh, do do is exhibit homosexual behaviour at times. So homosexuality is not restricted to humans. What might be restricted to humans, at least we don't know of any other case, is lifelong homosexuality. So in no zoo anywhere else in the world has a, great, a single great ape been said, oh, that guy's a homosexual great ape. That's no. never been the case. Um, there was a case of um, a troop of mountain gorillas that was studied um, where... Um, uh, other troop, it consisted of only of males. There was um, a silverback male, and a couple of blackbacks, and a couple of infant males, and their only female had died. Oh. And they then, for as long as that troop persisted, they exhibited homosexual behaviour. And that was anal sex, or yes. anal and a ratio. Yeah. There would be. There would be some competition between um, the silverback and one of the blackbacks. So they had oral sex, and they not had not oral, no, not oral sex. No. Oh, okay. Um, and but what about the orangutans and rape? Orangutans, as usual, are quite different from anything else, because orangutans have this phenomenon known as uh, arrested adolescence in males, 
Um, now, when, when a male orangutan becomes sexually mature, um, other things being equal, he enormously increases in size, he almost doubles his weight um, within two or three years, and he develops huge throat sacs and cheek flanges and so on, he deepens his voice. But um, it turns out that um, in some parts of orangutan's range, particularly in Sumatra, many males don't. They become sexually mature and they look like teenage boys for years and years and years, 20, 30 years. And what seems to um, determine whether they stay like that or whether they become physically mature is whether there is a dominant, ma fully mature, flanged male uh -huh. in the vicinity. Uh -huh. Because if they became dominant, developed cheek flanges, um, they would be seen as challenging the dominant male and there'd be a fight. I see. But um, the females are not very attracted to these arrested adolescents. Okay. And they, they have to chase the females, and that's when what's been called rape occurs. Oh. And yet, it seems that they have just about the same number of offspring as the flanged males. I see. Now, a while ago you mentioned that there was an old male group, the last female had died, and so there was some no homosexual behavior yeah. observed. How, I would imagine that occasionally there's a... a gorilla with a harem and the gorilla dies and so you have a f bunch of females that yeah. are all together. Would they be homosexual behavior there? Uh, it's, it's not known to happen, no. Okay. The f and they'd be in great danger because um, a male who uh, took over such a group that had lost its, its one and only silverback, um, another male who took over, first thing he'd do would be to kill the unweaned infants. Right, so that's quite common then, killing yeah. the unweaned infants. Yeah. Um, in mountain gorillas it's well known that um, uh, if um, um, one male, you know, um, if not a lone silverback I think, but uh, two troops of silverbacks are in the vicinity and um, it may happen that they interact peaceably or it may happen that one male will interact, will invade the troop of the other. And the first thing he will do will be to try to kill unweaned infants. And if that happens, a female, you know, she, she doesn't necessarily think, um, what a spiteful male, I'll avoid him. No. Yeah. She's As now, a homo sapien yeah, female would yeah, might. <laughs> she, she's now lost her tie with her original group. Yes. And so she will join the male who's shown himself to be dominant. Have you ever met Jane Goodall? Yes. Can you tell me about it? Um, well, the first time was in the 1960s when I was taking my PhD. She visited my supervisor. They were sitting chatting. And I went into the room to tell her she was wanted on the telephone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, next, the next time was her first visit to Australia in the 1990s. And I've, I've met her um, every time she's been to Australia, uh, including this last time, which was about 18 months ago in Sydney Town Hall. And I... What do you uh, think of her? Oh, yes, I think she's a great lady. She's done a lot. She's taught us a lot. Um, she's, she's taught... <laughs> she taught primatologists not to be afraid of naming yes. their, um, yeah. their, their subjects. She's um, taught us that there's a lot more in common between chimp and human behavior than we thought. At first, we thought that chimps were like humans, except very much nicer. And then she discovered that um, chimps are much like humans, but not necessarily nicer. Okay. And um, she's also... Um, She's completely changed the way in which um, we view chimps. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, chimps were being used as 
experimental animals. You know, you could do something to them that would um, that would cause their deaths, or you could do something disabling to them. And Jane Goodall sort of lectured, you know, on behalf of chimps. Chimps are like us; they have the same sort of emotional attachments to, for instance, their offspring. Their, even their adult offspring, females, and and their adult offspring still tend to associate. Um, and then um, um, this sort of took root um, until eventually the bio biomedical users of chimps were the only ones left with the old mentality. And even they have now changed. So that, for example, in uh, the United States, I think the law is it's now illegal to perform a biomedical experiment on chimps unless it's, you know, unless it's like a, a clinical trial on humans. Now, in human history, uh, there's something called genocide. For yeah. example, when Europeans came to North America, you, it was often described as genocide. Or and when Europeans Australia. came to Australia, it's yeah. often called... Yeah. Now, right now, humans seem to be doing species side mm. with most of the great apes. They're taking yeah. away their environments and their numbers are just plummeting. Yeah. So that's kind of like genocide, I guess. Yeah. And so that, what can one do about that? Yeah. Well, um, taking away their environment, one can't do anything except try to spread um, family planning in humans. Um, but... Uh, so the you think it, human overpopulation is, oh yeah. is, is by far the, is causing it's, it's, genocide it's, of another species. Yeah, it's it's it is causing genocide, and even when the other things have been fixed, it's what's waiting in the wings. Um, but um, in the meantime, the immediate things are um, humans are actually killing great apes. Um, in in West Africa, for example, um, for food, not not subsistence. And it's, it's become a sort of prestige food. Um, so that, um, you know, you buy your, your hunk of gorilla from the market and everybody, you know, admires you and you, you share this with people you want to impress. So what do you think the most successful thing is that you can do or I can do or the people listening here can do to prevent the extinction yeah. of our closest well, relatives? The field workers have done something very nice. They've often taken local people to see their study troops and um, say to them things like, um, now um, you, you will see this troop of gorillas. Uh, it's led by a silverback called Mbuba. Uh -huh. And you'll see how gentle Mbuba is. Uh, if he sees you, he may threaten you, but he probably won't, um, you know, won't, won't do anything bad to you. But um, you watch him with his females and his infants. And for instance, his female, one female called, they give her the name, you know, has recently given birth. And watch him, you know, being nice to this infant. And so, you know, they take them up to the gorillas and, and the villagers watch this. And... They've not regarded them as anything but either food or crop raiders yes. before. Yes. And they suddenly see, perhaps partly because, you know, the field workers told them about this, they suddenly see a gentle male who is nice to his family, taking care of them, um, is, is like a, a human being. They get completely different ideas. <coughs> and um, to the extent that um, the, um, uh, the, the rangers um, who look after mountain gorillas and um, the uh, other eastern gorillas are on the um, uh, Congo, Rwanda, Uganda border, um, they defend those gorillas with their lives. Um, and, you know, the, the eastern Congo is just um, full of, you know, little rebel groups 
when when one gets um, gets defeated by the Congolese army, another one springs up, mm. and they um, the safest place for a rebel group to hide is in the forest. Um, the things to eat in the forest are the small forest antelopes, and of course gorillas, and um, the uh, the rangers try to prevent them, killing the gorillas and the other animals there. And um, they know the gorillas by name, they document what's happening, um, changes of troops, the births, the deaths. And um, I think um, in Uganda about half a dozen rangers have been killed in the line of duty, in Rwanda about 30. Um, that ha doesn't happen anymore because the Ugandan and the Rwandan populations are, the term is, sensitised uh -huh. to the gorillas. In the Congo, about 150 rangers have been killed oh. in the line of duty simply because they've seen the gorillas as the field workers do, in fact, as they are, and they are willing to defend them with their lives. Oh. So are you, is there any charity that you give to? to yeah. Which charities are there? Um, well, uh, the one I, I subscribe to is, is a German group called um, Der Gorilla und Regenwald Direkt Hilfe. Der Gorilla und Regenwald? Direkt Hilfe. Der Gorilla, yeah. Mountain Gorilla Direct and Rainforest Direkt. And you've seen what they're doing? Yes. So they're the ones who are showing locals the... the yeah. The and um, they... Um, uh, Mainly what they do is top up other people's, um, other people's initiatives, but they, they do occasionally put out um, calls for, you know, we need more uniforms for the rangers. And of course the wearing of a uniform increases a ranger's prestige. I see, <laughs> okay. So that's, pre that's pretty good. You know, we need a new ranger centre to replace the one that was destroyed by such and such a rebel group. And An, so another, I've heard of tests that the, I think that have been done in Kyoto with bonobos about, yeah. uh, I think they show a bunch of squares and a bunch of numbers yeah. and then you're supposed to, in order, one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six. They're uh, common chimps. They're, they're common are. chimps, okay. Yeah. Now I've heard that the common chimps can do this better than humans yes. can. that's right. Yeah. And uh, so could you describe this? Well, um, uh, it's... Um, the uh, psychologist's name is Tetsuro Matsuzawa. And um, he, for a long time, uh, has been friends with a female chimp called Ai. And, you know, since she's bred and so on, you know, she's shown him her infants. And he, he now works with them too. And there's a, a room in which they have, you know, a series of computer screens. And Ai recognises... She recognises a lot of symbols. She sort of, you know, in a very limited fashion, she sort of talks to people with these computer screens. Um, but then she recognises the Arabic numerals and the order in which they occur. Uh -huh. So um, when they all appear on the screen in different places, she can, um, you know, uh, put her finger on them in order. One, two, three, four. So Seven, eight, nine. Yeah. And um, so um, what she can do is, um, uh, first of all, the numbers flash on the screen in any old order, uh -huh. up and down the screen. And then they're replaced by a series of squares, white squares, yes. on the black screen. And what I does is then she sort of puts her finger on the squares so they disappear one by one. And the square where the one was first, then the square where the two was, uh -huh. and so on, all the way up. I've been told that chimpanzees can do that more accurately to That's a larger right. number, and they can do it even with when it's Much know, more 100 quicker. milliseconds shown rather than 300 milliseconds or something like that. Yes. Or, or, um, so why is, I mean, we usually think that we're smarter than chimps, yeah. and yet that s somehow resembles something that a psychologist would give as an IQ test. Yeah. So, so that means chimps in this particular way are smarter, smarter. than us. Yeah. So why would that be? What is it about 
their yeah. brains that are different from ours that would let them be able to do that? Well, he, um, he has hypothesized that um, in their natural habitat, chimps would have to make snap decisions in a way that humans wouldn't. Um, for example, meeting a group of chimps, a snap decision. Are they the neighbouring community with whom we are friendly, the neighbouring community who are our enemies, or some of our community? At once. Why wouldn't we do that? I mean, our, our ancestors certainly did that too. Not, not quite in the same way. Um, you, can, you can suggest that um, our ancestors, of course, lived in a more open environment, woodlands, things mm. like that, where we see them from a, from a distance. Yes. We, um, we can communicate with each other. Who do you think that one is, that person is? Oh, he's from the neighboring village. Yes, we're friends with him. I see. How about uh, fire and the length of our intestines? How long have humans have, have had fire in cooking? And, uh, and I've heard that because we cook our food, our intestinal length was able to yeah. get like half as long as it used yeah. to or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's shorter than that of chimps. And gorillas and orangs? Gorillas have a huge long intestine. And orangs? Orangs, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure, not as long as a gorilla. And the shortness of our intestine and how weak our jaw is, is due to we've been cooking for so long? That's what Wrangham thinks, yeah. It seems quite, quite reasonable to me. Well, how long have we been cooking? Well, um, put it the other way, when did our jaws shrink? Yes. And that, that sort of begins around the Augusta Heidelbergensis transition. About a million years ago. About a million years ago? Yeah. Okay, and so it is interesting now that um, the oldest definite evidence of controlled fire from Wonderwork Cave in South Africa is about a million. And there is a claim of fire at Swatkrans, about a million and a half, but um, it might not be fire. If it is, it might not be controlled fire. So. What about the new discoveries in your field? For example, I think in the South African cave, some a bunch of human fossil or hominid fossils were found. I forget how old they were, but they were found in, in a cave. So you had to go through a very narrow opening. Yes. And what is that? Homo naledi. Homo naledi. Whoa, 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 whoa. Homo Sorry. naledi. All right. Yes, I got go, some, go some casts of it. Oh, you got some casts of Homo naledi. Oh, well, very good. They're, they're, um, very good. They're free. They're 3D prints. Okay, 3D prints of Homo naledi. Yeah, because right. they've been made available, and one of our PhD students uh -huh. was one of the one oh. of the students who crawled into the and cave. And so there they are. And That's yeah. Homo naledi. Yeah. Could you show them up to so, hold them right you know. here? Right here. Yeah. Let me try to get a focus on yeah. it. There, Homo naledi. The, um, so let me hold yeah. it there. Okay. There. That's the bottom of the skull or something. And That's then, the side. That's the and side. That's What's the that? lower jaw. And they're quite light, so they're made out of plastic then. Yeah. Okay, oh. can you run us through? Is that the same number of teeth as a... Yep. It's, it's um, yeah, the same, the number of teeth doesn't vary except the high um, frequency of loss of third molars in some modern populations. And a few old ones as well. Now they look like, if I look at this, I said that looks like a homo sapien. No. Um, What's first the thing is, it doesn't have the chin prominence. All Homo sapiens mandibles have um, a ridge here uh -huh. and a ridge there, oh. making it a sort of upside down T. Uh -huh. Even if they have a sort of receding chin. And this one doesn't have it. And this one has. Hold it up against. Oh, I can, okay. I can move around. I can move around. Go ahead. This one has a large ridge. Can you there. show it here? Put, show a large ridge right there. Called an inferior transverse torus. Oh. We don't have that. And anybody else have that? Chimps have that? Homo oh, erectus yeah. have that? That's some, um, yeah, that's something that goes way, way back. Uh, at the very least, old world monkeys. So these are tiny differences in ridges and yeah. bumps and yeah. things yeah. on, <laughs> and so that's what you, that's the bread and butter. <laughs> that's right. And um, this, these, this brow ridge is bigger than you can. Show me the brow ridge yet. There we are. Bigger than you get in Homo sapiens. Oh, there's a brown, that's the eyeball, it's the left eye we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, that's right. Cranial capacity is, I can't remember what they estimated it as, but it's quite small. 
quite <clears throat> and how long ago did this creature live? Uh huh. Good question. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. There are um, different dating methods are being tried. One of them came out with a result, but they would rather not publicize the figure until um, until the other methods, until they've got some more. Well, things. give us a rough range. Well, they are kind of primitive. Um, and they're sort of primitive erectus level. What advice do you have to students uh, who, are, who are looking at this question, are we alone? How can your expertise or how can a knowledge about primates and hominids and gorillas and how can that help us figure out our, whether we're alone or not? In the universe? In the universe or I guess on Earth. On I guess. Earth? <laughs> I don't know. We're, in some ways, we're alone. In other ways, if we see it, we're not. I mean, we we already have our dogs, don't we? <laughs> so we're not alone. <laughs> so we're not alone there. How about alone in the universe? Alone in the universe. Well, um, the universe being infinite, where does that leave us with them? Um, are, are there infinite other protohumans? I mean, you know my argument that, um, first of all, if we look for evidence of other intelligent life in the universe. We're seeing it as it was thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And um, uh, we don't know how long our civilization will last, the way we're going, not long perhaps. And is, is that the fate of all civilizations? If so, we there would have been quite a lot of them winking on and off throughout um, the history of the cosmos. And I, we don't know if there's any at the moment. We'll never know if there's any others at this moment. We may eventually learn whether there were others in the past.